All right. Well, Dr. Pamela Weibel, uh, welcome to Talk Mental Health with Logan Noon. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. Uh, you're talking to me from Oregon, right? Yep. Eugene, Oregon. Awesome. Awesome. So we're actually relatively close. Um, mm-hmm. You actually, we met briefly uh, when you were at my school a couple of weeks ago, Pacific Northwest University in mm-hmm. Yakima, Washington. Yeah, um, that was an awesome event. Yeah. You know, great it job. was and, nice and it on. brought out like some conversations that certainly just don't happen very often. And so I think it's really, really good. And I kind of consider you an expert in uh, like physician and medical student burnout. And you've really been a strong advocate. And I actually saw one of your TED Med videos years ago. So then when you came to the school, I was like, oh, yeah, I recognize this person. Like I, and then I had to go back my YouTube history and I saw that I watched it. Um, but so can you tell the listeners in like a 30 second elevator speech, essentially like who you are, what you do today. Um, and yeah, what you're all about. Yeah. I'm a family physician with an ideal clinic that I launched in Eugene, Oregon, where I invited my community to design their own clinic. So it's been an amazing, truly patient centered, extremely gratifying, you know, experience. And I love my job as a family doc. But along the way, I realized that we had a suicide crisis among doctors. I was actually suicidal myself preceding opening this clinic. Um, My suicidal thoughts were 100% occupationally induced. And so the solution to my despair was actually getting out of these dysfunctional big box clinics and launching my own practice. So that's made me sort of a happily ever after doctor. And... Uh um, I guess just to summarize in our 30 second intro here, sorry, I'm going on a while, is that, um, you know, that was the solution to my suicidal crisis, but I actually thought I was the only suicidal physician who had ever lived on the entire planet in 2004 when I was suicidal and come to realize eight years and uh, eight years later after opening my clinic, after losing three doctors to suicide in my town, that this is a real thing, a real epidemic, and it has been really hidden. Yeah. That's my passion. My passion is uncovering secrets and helping humans who are suffering. And uh, we're not going to solve this by keeping it a secret. No, certainly not. And thank you for the work that you do. You know, it's, it's 10 years ago. I I didn't even know I wanted to be a doctor at that point, but I had never heard of any such thing as like physician burnout or physician suicide. And, you know, by no means in 2019, is it perfect, but at least we're somewhat having that conversation now. And I think a lot of it is, is to people like you contributing and speaking out. So when did you though, you know, you mentioned that period of, of suicidal thoughts in your life, but is, did you quote unquote experience burnout once you became a physician and started working or was it once in medical school before then? So I actually surprisingly don't really use the word burnout because I feel like it's a victim blaming term that sort of identifies the physician or medical student as the problem. And really what we have going on here is a system dysfunction, malfunction, you know, in which people, um, let's just say bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, pre-med students and med students are sort of left in harm's way in educational facilities that are meant to protect and nurture them that actually injure them. Yeah. You know, and I think you've seen a lot of the data that empathy decreases throughout medical training and mental health issues increase throughout medical training. Well, that's not because these people were destined to have mental health issues or an exacerbation of their underlying mental health issues. What's happened is they've been placed in hazardous working conditions and unsafe educational environments with instructors who actually are suffering from mental health issues who are now in power positions who are either inadvertently or maliciously harming the next generation. So that's really what's going on. I'm very much a truth speaker. So I just sort of tell it like it is. And And that's how we like it. You know, when I listened to some of my old interviews from like, I don't know, 10 years ago, I was throwing around the word burnout over and over again, like it was a thing. But I think what's happened is that burnout is sort of almost like this trash can diagnosis that prevents us or label, you know, that prevents us from really discussing what is happening sort of underneath physician despair. 
you know, it's convenient, I guess, for systems to claim that it's an individual defect and that you just need to do more yoga and get more sleep, but that's actually not what's happening. It's, yeah. um, you know, it's a system dysfunction. It's hazardous working conditions that would not be allowed for truck drivers, pilots, or any other, um, you know, profession that holds safety as um, sacred. Well, and it seems to the mantra in medical school, it seems to be is like, treat the illness, the cause, not the symptoms kind of thing. And it mm-hmm. seems like when we say, oh, you should go do more yoga, you should exercise more, sleep more. That's kind of a symptomatic approach, rather than like, what is the root cause of this kind of like right. a systematic breakdown, like you're saying, you know, and it's, right. it, I almost feel like one of those kind of idealistic, naive doctors um you know i'm not even a doctor yet but i i of course want to live a fulfilling career and Mm -hmm. it it terrifies me and many of my colleagues that we're entering into a field that we might hate and it's it's scary yeah well just to let you know i used to be you i'm like the super idealistic still idealistic physician um, who was like a super idealistic, like probably uh, the award for idealism in my medical school class, which uh, led me to being belittled instead of honored for my idealism and my heart and soul. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I think like we're, we're the same, you know, that way. And yeah. so I just want to assure you, you can have an amazing career as a physician. That's really, what's really key is that you have to have the right mentors and, you know, people who are physicians already, who are obviously joyful, happy, loving their clinics, that sort of thing. Like those are the people, depending on the specialty you want to pursue that you would want for mentors. Because I think what happens is when we have physicians and power positions and in mentorship positions, these people who have not received mental health care and are cynical, jaded, and sort of counting down the days till retirement, like they're not really helping the next no. generation. They're not. Well, one of my mentors, and I really look up to her, is someone who I think you've interacted with, um, Dr. Vinia Menopod at Freud in Fashion. Does oh, that yeah. ring a bell? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, you know, years ago, I remember interacting with her because. I was just, at that time aspiring pre-med student and I always, I started my career as a mental health advocate, just speaking out about my bipolar disorder, but I didn't know any physicians who were like that. But I looked to her and she spoke out about her depression and anxiety and she was a physician who saw a therapist and I just, she gave me so much hope. So I, I emulate that I would like to have a career like that um, and just be happy because in, in my pre-med years, I met many doctors who told me, don't do it. This is a horrible, horrible career. And I tell my kids not to do it. And it's kind of scary um, yeah. th- in, in some respects. So um, so when, when did your career kind of shift from you experiencing burnout to you then helping others with, or not burnout, wh- wh- whatever we want to call it. Dis- I know. It's really hard yeah. to give it up because it's on the cover of every medical yeah. journal. But I don't know distress, despair, you know, yeah. like just kind of when did you become disillusioned as a physician and what? Exactly. Life? Well, yeah. when did you start to help others outside of just, you know, your own life kind of thing? Okay. So basically when I launched this clinic, so I was in a state, if you've ever been super depressed where you sort of can't get out of bed, I don't know if you've ever felt oh, that. Very right? much so. Yeah. Okay. So you're not particularly super creative in that moment. Like you're not able to sort of dig yourself out of the pothole too well. And so what happened is I, I had this, and it was again, a hundred percent occupationally induced, but I had this, um, vision or almost like a dream that came to me, a prophetic dream of uh, the community coming together and launching an ideal medical clinic so that, you know, literally we wouldn't be held hostage to third parties like, um, you know, insurance companies, all these, you know, third parties that try to get in the way with delivering um, Mm -hmm. amazing care for our patients. But so I led a series of town hall meetings, invited my community to launch my own clinic because I didn't have the resourcefulness or the Um, I was, I was like sick at the time I was depressed. Right. So I literally talk about going out on a limb. I went out and asked my patients to help me design an ideal clinic. Like I basically said, like these seven minute visits are making me depressed and suicidal. And you guys don't look very happy either on the receiving end of these seven minute visits. So let's just clean the slate and do it differently. 
I literally got 100 pages of written testimony. They told me what they wanted, and guess what? They really just wanted me and eye contact and answers to their medical problems in a small little low overhead cute office. So yeah. I was able to open this like a month later, and I've been literally happy ever since. However, um, what I realized that was super cool from this is it wasn't just like I could be the happily ever after family doc in Eugene, Oregon and live my life great, but how does that really help other doctors who I know are suffering? So I sort of felt compelled since I had found the answer to my uh, career disillusionment, which is being trapped mm -hmm. in a big box clinic in a cubicle. And my answer was like opening a real clinic where I could do house calls and love my patients. And I still take insurance and all that. Okay. But the thing is I wanted to help other doctors find their joy like I had. So I, I started teaching other doctors like how to launch their own clinic as okay. a solution to their despair being employees. Because as an aside, I just want to say that when you sort of ask physicians whether by nature they're an employee, a business owner, or entrepreneur, and I have a little like I can show you a, an article on quickly how to discover in like 10 mm -hmm. minutes or less which one you are. But let's just face it, most of us in medicine, like we're used to being, um, you know, you know, valedictorians, we're used to being presidents of clubs, we're used to being like the responsible person in high school, you know, and so we are by nature business owners and entrepreneurs, I think, uh, definitely yeah. business owners, like I don't think physicians are sort of meant to be employees, so we're, when we're in an employee situation, we're out of our native habitat. So I just really have to preface everything I say with when you force physicians to be out of their native habitat, kind of like an animal in a zoo that's no longer in their native habitat, you have them walking in circles in a cage feeling like yeah. oppressed, right? And then you get the natural mental health consequences of being locked in a cage that you don't belong in, in a location that you shouldn't even live in, right? So part of the frustration that physicians feel is they are out of their natural habitat when they're being funneled into these assembly line big box clinics and hospitals. And so by me breaking free, the N of one experience of living my dream as a doctor, once I realized, uh, I mean, I was certainly having the time my life and happily ever after. I love my patients. They love me. But what was really a shock is that I was making more money working on my own than working in these big box clinics. Wow. I think yeah. there is this feeling that people have that you're either going to like live from your heart and soul and be impoverished, or you're going to like um, sell your soul and have money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There is this thought, right? So I just want to make sure people, your listeners, medical students understand you actually can make more money doing what's right and living your dreams than selling your soul yeah. and certainly be happier. So that's, that's when I started actually actively helping other doctors like unleash themselves from their, you know, employers, right? But it took me eight years inside my clinic to realize that we actually had a suicide crisis because I was recognizing that I was sharing all this information, kind of like when you tell somebody to quit smoking and they keep coming back for their visits with their, six, you know, with yeah. six, with their Chains at like, the door. wait a minute. Yeah. So just telling you that it's possible to live a great life off cigarettes isn't helping like you actually need more um, skills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or there's something else going on that's really, let's just put in the realm of behavioral. There's a reason why this guy won't quit smoking. Like his dad smoked, his uncle smoked. Like it was a family thing. That's how he bonded with his relatives who've now died by yeah. one. But, you know, like it's a, it's a feel good feeling. He remembers his uncle Jim when he smokes. Well, kind of like telling doctors, Hey, you can launch your own clinic. You know, they get a PTSD deer in the headlights look often when I tell them that. And that's because they don't really need the information. Uh, they do need the information, but what they really need is mental health care. Like they can't even imagine from their non-resourced state of being an untreated victim of like PTSD, depression, anxiety, just from what they've witnessed at work. Let's just assume they were fine coming into medical training, but mm -hmm. they've now witnessed car accident victims had to tell families their child died, you know, maternal deaths, you know, on the OB ward, you know, like this kind of stuff is really traumatic and we yeah. don't have any mental health care that we're given. We're given punishment, but we're not given care. And so as a result, I think I just started to feel compelled that I needed to help physicians at a deeper mental health level because that's really getting in the way of them being successful business owners. Yeah. So, and you just, 
It does. And you just brought up one thing that I, I think was one of my favorite quotes kind of in the movie that I want you to also talk about that I was screened at our school, but how, you know, it, it is very analogous to PTSD because we see these horrific things and then we don't have really a space or a time to decompress It's Well, there's another patient in room eight. Let's go just whoop, move on. Mm -hmm. And I remember that was just one of the most powerful takeaways because I'm just such in my infancy of dealing with patients that, you know, I've experienced that a little bit, but you know, if you take that trauma time and time and time again at a chronic level, it's going to have devastating impacts. Yeah. I mean, just think about somebody who works in an emergency department. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not getting any debriefing from terrible things that they see all day long. You know, just yeah. as an example, this woman called me who is an amazing emergency doctor. Like you'd totally want her. If you were mangled in a car accident, she's your woman. She's mm -hmm. your, you know, she's your chance for life. Okay. But you have to look at the fact that, um, you know, this woman called me and she was having panic attacks and she felt like she should drop out of medicine and she really wasn't built for it, you know? And when I asked her a little bit more about her life, she told me that she's like this emergency doctor who puts herself in level one trauma centers to keep up her skills. She's like in her early thirties and um, literally she saved so many people mangled bodies from car accidents that she can't even drive a car anymore because wow. she is having panic attacks getting in a car and she had to spend $13,000 on Uber rides last year just to get to work. Wow. I mean, that's like some serious mental health consequences that she's having. And then, and then the reason why I probably remember her is that within a span of a week, I had two women call with very similar complaints. So that was one, right? Mm -hmm. um, which she wouldn't want her to give up her whole career. She's amazing at what she does. What she hasn't received is debriefing and support. Yeah. And like she hasn't received any, like most doctors I talk to, they've never been to therapy. I've been like for 30 years in therapy. I love therapy, yeah, but, um, but it's like, I think everyone should be in therapy. Like if you're a human being on the earth and you've ever seen something terrible, you should be in therapy. Okay. Just um, everybody. That's what yeah, they should eat everybody. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's just a good idea. So this other woman, um, a week later called me and it was the same story. It was almost like a photocopy of the previous okay. call. So she's a neonatology fellow, um, getting ready to finish uh, her training. And she's also having panic attacks, locking her in the closet, not sure if she can make it to work sort of thing. And I asked her about her day. Well, yeah, she's the only one up at night with 45 preemies in the hospital. And she is having panic attacks because any one of these little babies could die. Right. And, yeah. and then she's having to tell, Oh, plus she has to go on the helicopter to pick up half dead babies all night long. You know, if you think about what a neonatologist is doing, yeah. This yeah. is this is hardcore stuff, right? And then I asked her, well, not all the babies are making it, right? No. So you have to tell families who've tried infertility treatments for 10 years that their baby's dead, right? Right. Yeah. You have to do that multiple times a week, right? Have you ever gotten mental health support at work? She laughed. No, there's no support. Like, so you've never been to therapy and you've not had any mental health care and this is the work you're doing. So it seems kind of obvious to somebody who's like emotionally and spiritually progressive person yeah. that like that's a recipe for disaster. And if you're not having panic attacks, you're probably not human. Yes, certainly. Certainly. So right now you kind of like take emails and questions and like phone calls from physicians all over the country is and I know and that's the also world really yeah like all over the place yeah okay yeah. so how do you how do you manage that with that and your clinic kind of thing because I imagine you're just inundated in a sense well, yeah, like I never planned to run a suicide helpline. I think what happened is I'm a truth speaker. Like I just am somebody who can't lie and I just have to tell the truth, especially when it comes to human suffering and pain. And it's my job to like figure out why, you know, you know, as a physician, like we're supposed to figure out why people are suffering and help them. Right. So uh, I think it's kind of odd that people sometimes won't say some of these words out loud because it's kind of hard to, again, solve something if everyone's mm -hmm. running in circles pretending like it wasn't a suicide or pretending like they're not depressed or putting on the fake smile and the starch white coat every day and pretending to be a happy doctor, right? So um, I think what happened is I just started writing about the truth of my experience and the truth. I lost both the men I dated in med school to suicide, not while oh, I was wow. dating them by the way, but when they were married with kids, 39 and mm. 44 years old, they left their little kids and wives behind, you know, both men yeah, that's terrible. medical school. One I dated for three years and knew like every single thing about him more than his family, you know, like super close. Right. So the thing is that, um, 
you know, I recognized that this was a problem and I had personal experience with it because I lost both men I dated in med school to suicide and I almost lost my own life, you know, thinking about how to die in my sleep and all sorts of things like that, right? So I felt like at least I could talk from the first person experience and sort of hypothesize why I think doctors die by suicide. So in 2012, I just started writing about this. And I think the writing and the speaking, like people just, it was like, everyone started calling me and they wanted to tell me all their near misses with suicides as physicians and all their colleagues, you know, like I somehow just became like the repository for all this information and people just kept calling me. And so now I've like investigated personally, like 1300 doctor suicides. Wow. And so yeah. I have like a really deep understanding of why doctors choose to die by suicide. Um, and I've been on, you know, thousands of phone calls with physicians from the U S uh, UK, India, different places. Um, sometimes it's letters, sometimes it's phone calls, but you know, this is a global phenomenon and it is extremely serious. And it's just sad that our own profession, you know, medicine where we're in the profession to help and heal others. You know, we spend all our time reminding our patients, not to smoke and lock their guns and what their cholesterol is, but we don't even deal with the fact that our colleague just died by suicide in the next year. Yeah. I mean, it seems like really wacky. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, so I, I, I have a couple questions for you and this is kind of where I, we might disagree at just this point of kind of our career. So that experience, the screening we had on, um, whenever that was, I agree. September 20th. Okay, there we go. Yeah, when the screening at the school, you know, I, and it seemed like there was many individuals who've had bad experiences with the um, uh, PHP. Is that Physician Health Program? Yeah, Physician Program, Health Program, Program or or Medical Board. And like um, yeah, or some equivalent of it in whatever state that they're practicing. And so me in my infancy of my being, you know, I'm just a medical student. I look at those programs and I'm like, well, we have to use those programs because you know, they're going to be going to have the most resources, the most money, the most willpower. But I, I do totally respect that people have had very, very, very poor experiences with them. So I guess what is your attitude towards kind of the PHPs? And do you encourage people to actually use those PHP systems? Or sometimes it seems like they you rather them have a talk to you kind of thing or someone else like you kind of thing. Oh, I mean, I think that? what's most important is people get the help that they need in a okay. non punitive, 100% confidential environment. And these unfortunate PHPs, though they have helped people, I'm not like, I'm not into like demonizing any one group or any one yeah. person. I just think we should see um, these organizations for what they really are. And they have pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses. And if you look at the history of PHPs, they were created in the 1970s ish time to okay. deal with like the out of control cocaine addicted surgeon type personality, you know? So okay. back in the 1970s, you know, that's back when people could, you know, principals could beat the shit out of your kid at school and paddle them. You know, like you have to think about the mindset of where we were in the 1970s, where it was okay to like yeah. beat your kids up to get them to mind, you know, um, you know, like it was a different time than like, what is this 40 years later, you know, mm -hmm. at, or 50. And so back when these programs were created, they had the sort of like beat the shit out of the bad doctor model of okay. like, we got to help these addicted doctors who are a nightmare. Right. So, but it's just like 50 fast forward, 50 years later, beating the shit out of people and having a punitive environment that you call mental health care is actually causing more of a problem. Now let's just, when you look at it, there's like, I think, 46 different PHPs. Not every state has one, but most okay. states have one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, and they're associated with the medical boards and they have immunity from like a lot of laws and different procedures that you would expect that people follow like guilty before. Like privacy laws? Uh, or just privacy, confidentiality. They somehow okay. are behaving in ways where they don't feel like the Americans with Disability Act really like. Applies. Have, okay. You know, 
they sort of feel like they're, let's just put it above the law. Some of mm-hmm. them are behaving in ways where they're above the law. And then they're getting referrals for doctors that are disruptive or whatever, whatever. Okay. And some of those are retaliatory referrals. So you have to look at this for what it is. First of all, we have an organization that was created based on a model from the 1970s, kind of like medical education created uh, residencies on a model from over a hundred years ago. Is it still working? Not yeah. really. You know what I mean? I think Basically, using a medical education model that was based on a cocaine-addicted surgeon from 100 years ago has caused mental health issues and people 100 years later subjected to 28-hour working shifts and when they're not on cocaine and they can't stay up, right? Yeah. So this sort of uh, physician health program model, interestingly, I'm just realizing for the first time, is also modeled after the cocaine-addicted surgeon. So it's got like that old-school work your ass off, beat the shit out of bad doctors philosophy. Now, does it work today? Some of these physician health programs are really good when it comes to physicians who have substance abuse problems, like especially if they believe in the 12 step program, you know, like they're, they're, you know, not everyone wants to give it up to God. Some people don't believe in God, you know, like this whole Mm -hmm. give it to a higher power sort of religious perspective 12 step program it works probably for some cocaine addicted you know really difficult doctors in this bible belt who believe in that but it doesn't really work for atheist doctors um, who are purely science based and don't go to church and also don't have a substance abuse problems because mm-hmm. these programs it's kind of like if you're going to get brain surgery you wouldn't like stop over and see a dermatologist like you go to where who, where your problem is going to be solved if you have a skin problem go to dermatologist you have a substance abuse problem and aa is going to work go to aa if you have postpartum depression i don't think phps have a good track record helping physicians with postpartum depression mm-hmm. you know and so you have to just look at for your ailment is this organization going to work and what's happened is mostly because there's a lack of other support services for physicians. They've become the go-to group for any sort of physician that's misbehaving. But if you throw a bunch of doctors there with had sex with their patients, boundary issues, postpartum depression, cocaine addicted, like they're not going to do a good job with all of them. Some of them might get their needs met, but what ends up happening, I think the ones that you saw on stage, the families that came forward to share their stories, Mm -hmm. these are people who literally didn't really have any sort of patient care problem, didn't like were totally competent, great physicians in Washington. And they were thrown into these programs as one of them retaliation from one disgruntled nurse threw a doctor into that program and she couldn't find a way out and she didn't belong there. So she killed herself. Okay. Mm. The other guy was uh, Linda, Linda Siemens husband was already retired. And this um, complaint that was leveraged against him in his retirement literally was frivolous, but it got the medical board sort of on his ass as this regulatory beat the shit out of bad doctors organization. I mean, that's mm-hmm. their, their, the role of medical boards is to protect the public against us. So I think it's really important for medical students, uh, trainees and physicians to understand like when you're getting help, because we all will have mental health problems, it's really important for you to go to a place that's safe where you can fully disclose everything and it's not going to get back to your dean, the medical board, revoke your license or cause problem. You know, like the last skill set that most physicians lose is their ability to care for patients. They'll lose their marriage before that. They'll be estranged with their kids yeah. before that. I mean, like we've worked so hard to get this degree. It's like our prize trophy. And it's like, we're so responsible. It's seriously, a lot of these physicians, especially the whistleblower types, they're in there checking on their patients in the hours before they shoot themselves on the head. They're doing surgeries. Like the last skill that they lose is patient care. But the problem is that they're thrown into some of these regulatory agencies that don't necessarily help them and then harm their careers. And then they feel like they have nothing left to lose except their life. You know? I see. So let me ask you, the, the week after that screening, we, so I have didactics on campus, right? Uh-huh. Um, and so we had like a discussion just kind of about, you know, physician suicide, medical student suicide, the movie, of course. And one of my classmates brought up advice that, um, you know, when we go and work for residencies or uh, eventually hospitals, whatever, whatever, um, 
he advised ad- lying on those forms, whatever those forms are. Like if yeah. you have ever had any medical yeah, the, mental health condition or right, whatever, right, right. Um, because it's just going to bring you more headache and harm than, uh, than not than being mm-hmm. honest and open. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think if you haven't read my article, I did a research project this summer with a medical student who volunteered with me all summer long, and we pulled all the mental health questions out of every one of the 50 state and the District of Columbia medical licensing applications and compared them to see which ones were breaking the Americans with Disabilities Act and what happened to people who checked the yes box. And people who checked the yes box, first of all, there's four states that don't ask mental health questions, which is friggin' awesome. New York, Connecticut, Uh, Hawaii and Michigan ask zero mental health questions or impairment questions on their licensing applications. So the physicians in those states wouldn't have to lie, right? They could just get their license like everyone else in six weeks or eight weeks or however long it takes, right? But what happens if you check the yes box in some states, and there are states that are very punitive, like Florida, like Alaska, um, they may have you Uh, do a range of things. First of all, you have to explain your whole mental health history, you know, and and submit documents, including your diagnosis codes, uh, write-ups from your psychiatrist. Like you are going to spend a lot of time sort of defending your right to receive mental health care. You may be asked to speak in front of the board and defend yourself for having sought mental health care and to prove to them that you're not a danger to patients, you know, just because like you had postpartum depression or you had test anxiety in med school, you know, if you okay. check that box, box appropriately, then you're mostly, I think in most states, you're flagged as impaired until proven otherwise. And then they put you through a process. Now the process could just be like turning in, it's still invasive. You're, discharge summaries from hospitalizations or a note from your psychiatrist that says you're safe, right? But a lot of times they will mandate that you go to one of their preferred psychiatrists and they have to review everything. So it's like more cost to you, more delay. And then it's like this whole subjective realm, which is like, okay, after all this, are they going to give me my license? Is my license just going to be delayed by six weeks? But my all my friends got their licenses right away, but do I have to wait six more months? Or are they going to like tell me that I can't practice in this state because they have all the power, you know? And so I think what happens is some doctors, first of all, you never know where you're going to end up practicing because you don't know who you're going to fall in love with and where they're in where your in-laws live, you know, like you could end up living anywhere in this country. Right. And so people just get really nervous about having anything on their record, even though I personally would love to have a world where everyone fully discloses everything where we're not punished. And I think that's where we're heading. It's just that this middle zone where we still have punitive organizations and um, regulatory environment where physicians are punished if they reveal these things, not by all states, but some states, not by all hospitals, but some hospitals won't give you privileges if you admit that you have mental health problems. I mean, I've talked to physicians who sit on committees at hospitals and they, as soon as you check that box, will not give you hospital privileges. Hmm. And it's totally discrimination. It's against the Americans with Disabilities Act, but so far they've not, um, they've been able to continue behaving this way. You know, so I do think there's a risk. It's not across the board. That's why it's hard to generalize because it's like, oh, yeah, some states, they don't ask the question at all. Mm -hmm. Other states, they put you through the ringer. You know, so basically, if you applied for five state licenses, you might have one state that doesn't ask you any questions and you're a shoe in. You might have two states that delay your license because you check the yes box and you have to meet with them. You might have another state that like won't let you have your license but that's where your girlfriend lives. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And so now you're screwed because you can't live in the state where your in-laws are, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm just giving you like, we're in a period of transition where it's only going to help that like in mass, if more physicians and medical students stood up and said, Hey, I have mental health issues and don't discriminate against me. I'm a competent doctor. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's what we need more brave people like you, but there is a potential um, downside <laughs> If, yeah. uh, if you check that box, that's all. Yeah, yeah. I remember right when the movie finished, my, uh, one of my classmates' husbands turns to me and goes, you know, Logan, like you kind of host that podcast, talk mental health of Logan, dude, you know, you're quite open about your experiences. He's like, what are you going to do about this? And I, it's definitely something that worries me. And, but I just try to stay really in like a mindful sense. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I'll face that 
-hmm. when I do it and, you know, I'm just going to check, yes, I have bipolar and I'll face Mm -hmm. the consequences of however Mm -hmm. it may be. And Mm -hmm. I I do want to try to run my own practice and hopefully that that will be a little easier in some respects. Yeah, it'll probably be easier. Yeah. 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 It certainly um, is, is a worry for me. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a, and also I know, you know, so I'm a third year pursuing residencies, some residencies looking at, oh, Logan Noon has bipolar disorder. I do not want him here Mm -hmm. uh, because maybe they're one of those residencies that does have a hundred hour shifts kind of Mm -hmm. thing or whatever. And I know if I don't sleep for a couple nights in a row, that is probably one of the easiest triggers for my manic episode. Right. Right. You know, so it's like, geez, I don't want to do that. So it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely nerve wracking, you know, at least in my situation right now. But you don't want to go into surgery, do you? No, I want to go into psychiatry. No, that's what I, I thought. So then yeah. you're, you're set and that shouldn't really be a problem because okay. psychiatry residencies are much more progressive than other residencies. And just so you know, if you haven't heard about it, the psychiatrists um, at New Haven uh, Hospital, so through Yale, right? Oh, okay. They just staged a big um, uh, residence and fellows bill of rights where they interrupted the graduate medical education meeting and in front of all their faculty, like unrolled this big banner that says physicians are humans too huh. and uh, unleashed on them this uh, physician's, uh, well, residence bill of rights, uh, like a right to having weekly mental health care, a right wow. to all these things. And their program, by the way, the psychiatry program at New Haven, FYI, like they encouraged you to have weekly mental health care, oh, wow. psychotherapy. So every single one of their psychiatrists are getting weekly psychotherapy. Isn't that cool? And so that is fantastic. So but, hopefully but, we have a listener from Yale and yeah. uh, I could apply. I don't think I have the numbers for Yale, but hey, you know, I'll take a swing at the bat. You know, but what was know. really cool is like these psychiatrists knew that the so many 600 other residents associated with the hospital weren't getting weekly psychotherapy. It was just okay. their progressive psychiatry residency that was offering that. And by the way, it was on paper charts with somebody in the community and not in the EMR. Like, so totally, this is what I mean by like okay. 100% confidential, non-discoverable. They can go funded by their, you know, insurance that they get, right? And what they were going to bat for, which is really truly beautiful is they did this not so much for themselves because they feel like they're in a really good program, but they did it because they want every other of those 600 residents to be getting weekly psychotherapy too. And they think that it should be the norm for what we all receive in training. So is that cool? That is very, very cool. I'm very inspired to hear that. And yeah, I mean, my... I start a neurology rotation actually tomorrow and I am very excited for that considering neurology, but I would put a thousand dollars on that I end up in psychiatry. Kind of, uh, it's, yeah. it's why why I pursued medicine in the first place was my diagnosis of mm-hmm. bipolar disorder. Okay, mm-hmm. so I have now a series of questions. Um, so you know, being being that you're so knowledgeable about this space, how do you feel like healthcare policy can positively or negatively affect physicians' experience, aka? Um, like a health Medicare for all plan, would that lead to essentially more satisfied physicians potentially or not is, is more privatized system uh, going to lead to maybe more satisfied physicians? What do you think? So I think that any system can uh, fail or succeed depending on who's at the helm, who's the, who's leading the system. So you could have like the best thing ever, socialized medicine or Medicare for all, whatever, all you can eat buffet for everyone, healthcare is a right. But if it's led by a government or people that are unethical, then the whole thing sort of um, implodes on itself in a way. Same thing with like for-profit insurance. Like I still take for-profit insurance. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the companies that are actually more, um, uh, that, that, that actually honor the, the, their, their clients' premiums and pay physicians on time and, and, okay. and behave well, right? They don't uh, bully the, their, their um uh, clients, they're the, the physicians or the patients, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you have a for-profit insurance company that's led by um, somebody who's ethical, you know, that could succeed. You know, like most of what's going on in the U.S., if you look at all businesses across the board are for-profit, like a minuscule number of all businesses in the U.S. are nonprofit. But, you know, whether they succeed or fail depends on who's leading them. So I'm less concerned about like what the name is on the proposed silver bullet solution and who is behind it and are they ethical 
you know okay. what I mean? So, and the other thing that's really important is um, a precept, like when the people lead, the leaders will follow. And so when you have an emboldened population that feels empowered, it's harder to harm them with poor leadership. You know what I mean? It's almost like you force the leadership to do their job. So for example, if you had a bunch of medical students who are just like, well, let's put down our heads and like do what we're supposed to do and not create waves and try to pass our test, you know, like you'll perpetuate a power, a power dynamic in your school where administration kind of takes their own course and you're just a passive recipient of whatever they dole out, right? But as medical students, if you get together and start a petition or bring a medical student's bill of rights up to your medical school, you know, then you're kind of forcing the people in power positions to lead properly. It's yeah. very hard to lead a bunch of victims, right? So we have to, I think, as physicians and medical students, break out of victim mode, which means we have to stop with the cynicism, the jadedness, like, and actually, like, we have the resourcefulness and the brain power to really solve our problems, but we need to step up and uh, get out of the lazy boy chair and, 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 and actually, you know, state what we want and come together as a unified group. So, yeah. yeah. So one of my favorite professors at school, uh, Dr. Baldwin, he's a, a seasoned nephrologist, uh, very, um, he's in, towards the end of his career, really has a lot of wisdom, love talking with the guy. He's going to come on my show and talk about this same issue. And his really big proposal that he thinks would be best is if doctors unionize. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about like a union ship for doctors? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, unions are anything that gets people together and gets them up out of victim thinking and creates, um, you know, a situation where they can negotiate for their rights and, um, you know, come together as a group is really powerful. And physicians are allowed to unionize as long as they're employees, just to let you know. It's illegal okay. for physicians who are non-employees to unionize. Um, be, oh, wow. So illegal, if, right? So, so you own your own clinic, you could not join a union? No, I'm not allowed to do it because wow. okay. I can't be represented. So if you look at like the nurses union, the nurses are all employees. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that works, right? Physicians can unionize at certain hospitals um, or as residents can unionize. And there, there are um, unions like the Committee of Interns and Residents in New York City that represents all the residents and interns in New York City. Um, you know, whether they're effective or not is a whole nother conversation, but I okay. still think it's like awesome. Of course, if you're an employee, you deserve that you're right should be respected, that you shouldn't be working more than eight hour shifts without a 30 minute lunch break and 15 minute breaks. I mean, that's what they do at Starbucks. That's what they do at PetSmart. Yeah. Like that's what uh, pilots get. That's what truck drivers have to stop. I literally hung out at a truck stop recently and asked the truck drivers, like, when are they mandated for breaks and what's their sleep schedule like? They're like, if they drive their rig more than seven and a half hours straight, an alarm goes off and they have to get out of their truck. They cannot wow. keep moving more than seven and a half hours. And so to think that somehow residents can function at three times the shift length of a pilot or a truck driver is ludicrous and should be illegal. You know, but the only way that we're going to end up prevailing is when residents stand up and say no to the essentially human rights violations, right? Yeah. So we have a situation where we really have uh, human rights violations and hazardous working conditions that cause people to have psychotic breaks on shift that cause people to end up having sleep deprivation seizures in the hospital. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So. And that was a really, I remember that about the movie. I mean, that was uh, a really, really powerful thing to see that someone did actually have those seizures. I'm sure it happens all the time. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we would keep, keep referring to this movie, this screening, um, but I guess we still haven't even said the title. Can you tell the listeners the movie that we're talking about, it's the title, called, and yeah, how to find you it? No Harm, Exposing the Hippocratic Hoax, and it's about exposing the silent epidemic of medical student and physician suicides. And it's by an Emmy-winning filmmaker, Robin Simons. Some people say it's my film. It's not my film. I'm just interviewed in the film. Yep. Um, a lot of people are interviewed in the film, but this is the brainchild of an Emmy winning filmmaker who's, who's been following these families around since 2014 uh, for four years and got these, I, I think you probably felt a kinship with the medical student and his family, like yeah. John and Michelle deal in there. Right. And sort I, of heroes for medical students, you know, they're like the, yeah. the mom and dad that really speaks openly about their child's struggles in med school. 
And I, I had to take a step back, and this is what me and Hannah, who we did the, the review episode on that, um, that movie, you know, it was, it was kind of sad, but we both said the same thing. Like, we weren't surprised by any of it. We're like, oh, yeah, like, we, we make sense. This makes sense, like, because we're in the trenches of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, thinking about people who are so removed from medicine that don't think about this issue every day, I think it does a really nice job to bring up the things that medical students and physicians deal with. And, uh, you know, I, of course, only saw the the abbreviated version. I think it was like 60 minutes or something. Right. Um, so then is the the movie is currently still being screened? Yeah, it's being location? screened around the country. And then I think, from my understanding, it should be on PBS in the spring of 2020 and then maybe cool. on Amazon Prime sometime next year in the fall. I don't know. It'll eventually be available to everyone. And you definitely should see the 85-minute version. It's less, you know, choppy and has more, you know, hard content. So, yeah, no, I and I, I definitely will check it out. I, I think it's good for everyone to see. Um, you know, I I don't know exactly all the ways to improve the situation it is, but I think at least by talking about it, we're moving the needle in the right direction. Yeah, so, you're doing a lot to improve it. You are. This is a great um, podcast. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. So a couple couple other questions before uh, I let you enjoy the rest of your Sunday here. Um, is is whatever burnout for lack of a better term is it equivalent essentially in every single country or are there other countries that we can look to like oh that's a more ideal system kind of thing and is america the worst or like i i don't know those stats at all oh well i mean as far as well i mean just to kind of go back to the burnout thing i think like burnout um by the way the history of the word burnout is a term that was used in the 1970s to describe people that were dying of end-stage drug addiction in alleyways so in the 1970s like if you were shooting up in an alleyway in new york city or philadelphia and you died like you're a burnout that's what they that that's the origin of the term and then it started moving into social work circles like people that volunteered at free clinics servicing helping the people who are drug addicted um started to feel like a sense of despair like this is really hard work and they weren't making progress so they started they started referring to themselves as burned out from sort of helping the burnouts Mm -hmm. you know and then in 1981 it migrated into the physician territory I mean there was a guy that wrote a book on like burned out for women burnout for perfectionists like so everyone wanted to be burned out bus drivers housewives you know doctor you know and so when you think of a term that's just used like to apply to everyone it sort of is dilute in its meaning Mm -hmm. and so I think that um I personally believe like, hey, if you're a CPA and it's tax time and you've taken on a bunch of more cases and you voluntarily decided to do a bunch more people's taxes, like maybe you're burned out because you voluntarily decided to do a hell of a lot more work in um, April, right? But that's very different than an intern forced to work 28 hour shifts and uh, without proper supervision and over 100 hour work weeks, you know, because the 80 hour cap isn't enforced. That I, that I wouldn't call it burnout. I would call again, human rights violations. And when you look across the globe, your question like, is this a global phenomenon? It most certainly is because, I mean, I just got a report the other day from Lithuania, a doctor that was sort of overworked and bullied and abused by his superiors and he died by suicide. I get tons of reports from India. I think it's like this medical culture of competition, bullying those, survival of the fittest, throw it, trying to throw the weak, weak ones under the bus, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is a behavior that is almost like across the globe, but definitely terrible in India, US, UK, um, you know, there's some places where maybe it's better. I mean, I don't get a lot of cases submitted from, I don't know, like, France? Is it better in France? I don't know. I don't live in France. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really tell you like which places are awesome, but I know like I've had some people from Nigeria tell me this doesn't really exist in Nigeria, but Nigeria is so closed about the whole concept of suicide that they're sort of covering up all these suicides. So it's kind of hard to know because of the taboo nature of suicide and the unwillingness of physicians to really bear their souls with one another, which I think is just part of the job we're supposed to put on the game face yeah. keep going right i think it's hard to know like where is it good where is it bad um, but i do know that physicians who are self-employed in business models where their patients love them like they can be happy anywhere you know yeah. and so the key is for us to take care of our mental health and to be in a specialty and business model that really fits our personality and then i think we can absolutely thrive as physicians in many different countries yeah 
And yeah. one thing actually me and Hannah talked about on, on our uh, review episode of the, the movie, um, you know, it's, we of course put so much energy into becoming physicians, so much work and money and, and really everything, but being a physician isn't everything about us. You know, our identity should be more than just a physician, whether that be a, a husband or a wife, a mother, father, uh, like I always joke, like a golfer, amateur race car driver, like, you know, I want to have my identity be so many different things that, you know, worst case scenario, if my license were to ever be provoked, like my identity is more than just, just that piece right. of paper, that license kind of thing. And that is super important. And I commend you for, for saying that. Um, the problem is a lot of physicians like say neurosurgeons that have been through an unbelievable mm -hmm. amount of stress and millions tests. And now they're a neurosurgeon and they're doing brain surgery, whatever. If they have their license revoked, it feels like, you know, 25 years of their life's work yeah. has just been thrown in the trash. You know, whereas, yeah, it's not as hard primary care psychiatry, less, less years of education and potentially you could still do some really cool stuff. But if your heart was like set on brain surgery or OR type stuff and you have your license revoked or, you know, one surgeon, he cursed in the OR because he was really upset because a nurse that was supposed to be in charge of the case was on, uh, on the computer ordering stuff for her koi fish tank from Home Depot and not paying attention to the case, right? But guess who got in trouble? Not the nurse that was buying stuff from Home Depot. The physician got in trouble for cursing and then sent to like uh, the physician health program or in yeah, trouble with the medical board. That's so insanely fucked up. <laughs> this yeah. is what I mean. It's yeah. like there's this um, way that physicians are supposed to behave and there's this concept that either you're on the pedestal or you're friggin' dead on the sidewalk. Like there's not a lot of yeah. space between just on binary. the pedestal yeah. or in your grave. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can start accepting medical students, residents, physicians as real humans, human beings and protecting them with the laws that protect real human beings and in, in the airline industry and the trucking industry, you know, like we wouldn't have the exacerbations or the initiation of mental health problems if we got the support we needed and we were in non-hazardous working conditions. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? No, absolutely. Well, yeah. We're coming up on just about an hour here and, and thank you so much for, for coming on this show. So how can the audience members uh, find you and like yeah. follow the rest of your work? Like idealmedicalcare.org. I return every email, every phone call, except for the ones on patients. I have a bunch of patients that are writing me about my doctor sucks. I hate my doctor. I need another doctor. Like, oh my gosh, if I start answering those questions, I'll never get any sleep. But I do answer every single email from a medical student, resident, or physician, because these are the people that I feel like compelled to help. And once we can get really healthy medical students and physicians, all the patients will get their needs met too. That's the great um, yeah. side benefit, you know? Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. Thanks again for coming on the show. This has been really a pleasure and, uh, we should do this again. All right. I'm here if you ever need me. All right. Very cool. So I'll, uh, I'll send you kind of a recording of, of the podcast, um, ahead of time and then send you like a, a release. Like I give Logan Noon permission to post this on his podcast, yada, yada. Um, and if you want to listen to it and feel like, Hey, I need this section removed. If you, no, 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 you can okay. totally use everything. Okay. Perfect. I don't, I don't, you don't need to get my approval. Okay. I mean, I'll sign whatever you want, but go for and, it. And, um, another thing. So my, I've been using this software and it also records our video today that we had. Mm -hmm. So if you feel comfortable, I can post that on YouTube too. Some people like watching the podcast that way. Okay, sure. Go for it. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks again. This was a great conversation, great episode. And yeah, we should maybe touch base again in a year or so and do a follow-up episode. I think that'd be that awesome. That would be great when the film's actually out for the whole general population to see. That should be yeah. wild. And I can, I talk about, I guess, kind of the, the match experience. Cause I know that's going to be, yeah, right. be a, a wild journey. So yeah, well, thanks again so much. This has been such a pleasure. Awesome. Okay. Bye. All right. Enjoy your Sunday. Okay. Bye. Bye.